wonder, but here we go, John chapter number 3, verse number 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now drop down to verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now turn to 1 John. All of these fairly familiar passages of Scripture. 1 John 5, verse number 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is is his eternal is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. In these three passages of Scripture, they're strikingly similar in their makeup. In fact, if you found them just laying someplace, these three passages of Scripture, you might come to the conclusion that they were all spoken at the same time as part of one particular message by the same person. But the fact of the matter is, we just heard from three different speakers. John 3, 14 to 18 was spoken by our Lord. John 3.36 was spoken by John the Baptist. And 1 John 5 was spoken by the Apostle John. So here we have three distinguished preachers, all taking up the subject. And then you have me. (laughs) Now, I cannot hope to add to what they have said. I trust the Holy Spirit will not allow me to subtract from what they said. But maybe we can get that same power, that power of the Holy Spirit, to look practically at the application of these statements. Title of this morning's message, Dead or Alive? Dead or Alive? Let's pray. Father, we bless your name, and we are so thrilled to be your children. But as we look at your word and know the majesty of it, and we understand the depths of of what you said. We know that our minds cannot get where we need to go, nor could I lead these people to where they need to go. But Father, we know that the Lord Jesus already purchased for us what we need. And we know that the Holy Spirit is very capable of guiding our minds to truth. So we ask that the Lord Jesus would be honored and glorified and the Holy Spirit would do his teaching and that each heart would be touched the way that it needs to be touched this morning. Do your work, your way amongst your people. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Back in the days of the Old West, posters would be printed of outlaws. It would have their portrait and the crimes that they had committed And they would be posted on trees and all over the buildings. And underneath the amount of money, the reward money that was being posted for this outlaw, there would be three words generally. It would say wanted. And underneath that it would say dead or alive. Now what does that mean? What that means is, it didn't matter to the government. It didn't matter to, these, these, the, to the, uh, the authorities then whether you were dead or alive. All they wanted you was they wanted you brought in. 
And it didn't matter whether you were breathing or not. It didn't matter if you were riding in the saddle or over the saddle. They didn't care. Either way was fine with them. It did matter to that guy. It mattered a great deal to him. Because dead is one thing and alive is another thing. And you cannot be both. You are either dead or alive. So it is in our spiritual life. You are either dead or alive. You are one or the other. You cannot be both. So let's explore these passages of Scripture that are actually stating this clearly um, with four questions this morning. Question number one. Are you dead or alive? Are you dead or alive? This is a pretty important question, is it not? Because you cannot be both. You are either dead or alive. You are spiritually dead or you are spiritually alive. One of the two. So let's lay down the facts of this particular question. Ephesians chapter number 2 tells us that we were dead in trespasses and sins. The wages of sin is death. Our sin that we have committed formed an impenetrable barrier between God and man. We are dead. We are spiritually dead. And there is absolutely, positively nothing that you can do about that. If you have sinned on this planet, you are spiritually dead. And for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are spiritually dead. And the wrath of God on that sin is ready to fall. We are spiritually dead. Eternal death. Eternal separation from God is the punishment. And ask yourself, did anybody deserve it more than you? For the wrath of God to fall, you have to look at yourself and say, I deserve it. More, is that as much or as more than anybody else on the planet? I deserve this wrath to fall. I am spiritually dead. Galatians 4 tells us, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Look at our text verse here in John chapter number 3, please. John chapter number 3, where we were at. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Here we have... And a very clear explanation of our problem. It is actually a, a message in and of itself. Verse number 14 refers to the brazen serpent from, from Numbers chapter 21. Remember when Moses, the children have sinned, they have been rebelling against God. They've been complaining and this, the poisonous snakes are coming and biting everybody. And Moses puts up that brass serpent on that pole. And all they had to do was what? Look and live. That's how they had to do. And this is what they're referring to in this statement. The method of death is given to us here in this passage. Christ, in the same manner as that brass serpent, must be lifted up. And what does that mean? It means that on that cross, he must be lifted up high above the earth. It's predicting that he would die on a cross here. Just like that brass serpent was on a pole, Christ had to be lifted up from the earth. So the method of death is given. In verse number 15, it's death or life, and our means of obtaining this promise is given. Believing. The scope of this promise is whosoever 
the result of this promise is eternal life. Verse number 16 gives us the motivating factor of God, which is His love for us. Verse 17 tells us the reason that He came. He did not come to condemn us. We were already condemned in trespasses and sins. He came to save. And verse number 18 gives us the dividing line. Life or death. Believing or not Believing. It is a very clear passage of Scripture to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now don't make a mistake here. The word, word believing here does not mean to believe in the historical fact. If I said, do you believe that Christopher Columbus came across the ocean in 1492? And everybody would say, yes, I believe that. But believing or disbelieving is not that big of a deal. It's a historic fact, and what you believe about it doesn't change anything. If you said, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Well, if you say you don't believe that, they don't change the facts. 2,000 years ago, it happened. It's a historical fact. The fact that you believe that it happened, there's no merit in that. It's just believing the facts. That is not what is talking, being talked about here. When it's talking about believing, to believe on him means to not only say, yes, he died on a cross. It means that you say he was dying there in my place. He was paying my sin debt. And the work is finished because three days later, God the Father raised him from the dead. My sin debt is paid in full by the finished work of Christ. That's what it means to believe. Not that you just believe the fact that he actually hung on a cross and died there. That's a historical fact. When it was talking about believing, it means that you believe that, that was there for you. he was there for you, dying in your place, and that he finished that work. Do you believe that? John 3 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Are you dead or alive? You cannot be both. You are either at this moment dead or you are alive. Which are you? That's question number one. Are you dead or alive? Question number two. Do you know that you're alive? Do you know that you're alive? You say, well, that's the exact same question. Well, not really. A person can be in a coma and not know that they're alive. Have you not ever in your lifetime dreamed and in that dream, you're not sure whether you're actually dead or alive at that moment. A person is either alive spiritually or dead spiritually. That's a fact. You're one or the other. But at that same time, that same person may think that they're alive when they're dead, or they may think that they're dead when they're alive. You are either dead or alive. That's, that's the truth. But do you know? Do you know that you're alive? How many people on the planet are pretty sure they're on their way to heaven because they have followed some religion? How many people are assured that they're on their way to heaven because they've attended a Bible-believing church all of their life? How many people believe they're saved because their mom led them to pray some prayer when they were four years old? And that's all they know, but they believe that they're on their way to heaven. On the other side, how many people have gone, gone almost their entire life wondering, am I alive or dead? Wondering, when I was a little kid, did I pray enough? Did I mean it enough? How many people have wondered and had their Christian growth stymied because they're too busy wondering if they're alive or dead to grow the way that they should? I'm asking you this morning, do you know that you are alive? Do you know it? You say, well, 
How am I supposed to know that? The answer is extremely simple. John 5, 39. Search the scripture, for in them ye think that ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now Jesus Christ said this to a bunch of Jews who were at that moment in a fit of religious fervor getting ready to murder him. In their thoughts, they were doing the right thing. In their thought, they were serving God, securing their own salvation. And the Lord says, why don't you take a moment to look in the book? If you take a moment to look in the book, you would understand that they are not testifying of you, they're testifying of me. They're not condoning what you're doing, they are speaking of me. And if you would take a chance to look in the book, you'd find out that what you are believing is false. This is the answer to our problem. I challenge you this morning, if you say, I don't know if I'm on my way to heaven. I don't know if I have life. I'll challenge you with the same statement. Search the scriptures. If you don't know for absolute sure that you're alive, then search the scriptures. Let the scriptures verify or destroy your hope of heaven. In our passage in 1 John 5, 1 John 5, 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Know means to have a settled, absolute knowledge. I know that I have eternal life. How do you know? These things have I written unto you. My friend, your knowing whether you're alive or dead is found in the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Let me issue a two-sided challenge this morning. If you think that you are on your way to heaven this morning by some other way or by even the slightest addition to the finished work of Jesus Christ, search the scriptures. If you think you're going to get to heaven by any other method other than the finished work of Jesus Christ, I'm telling you right now, you want to know? Search the scriptures. I challenge you to start reading in the book of John. And every day say, God, show me, am I alive or dead here? Search the scriptures. Start reading the Gospel of John and ask the Spirit of God to confirm or reject your belief. It's a very simple challenge. Our knowing that we're saved is based in the Scriptures. On the other side of that, so many people who grew up in church, they know the Gospel they are convinced that the gospel is true, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But they're not sure that they have actually accepted it. I issue you the same challenge. To search the scripture. If you're sitting here this morning saying, I just don't know if I've trusted Christ. I know that the gospel is true. I know that Christ died, that he buried, was buried, and he rose again the third day. I know that. I'm just not sure if I'm saved. Let me issue the same challenge. Search the scriptures. You need to search some more specific scriptures because you already have the knowledge. You're not searching for knowledge here. Let me give you four verses. If you've had doubts, you're not sure. Let me give you four verses. Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 10.13, and John 3.16. And I'm challenging you to read those over and over and over. Until the light dawns on the Holy, by the Holy Spirit that's, that confirms or rejects your, dis, your knowledge. You either are dead or alive. And you need to know it. You're one or the other. Do you know that you're alive? The answer is found in searching the scriptures. Not going back and asking your mom, what did I do when I was four? You'll never get any assurance from that. Not from trying to conjure up your own thoughts on the matter. 
It is found in the scriptures, my friend. Search the scripture and let the Holy Spirit bring convincement to your heart. Settle it on the word of God. This is how we know we're on our way to heaven. Question one, are you dead or alive? Question two, do you know that you're alive? Question number three, what kind of life do you have? What kind of life do you have? Now, from here on, we're speaking strictly to those who know that they're alive in Christ. If you're not sure you're alive in Christ, the first half of the message was for you. If you know that you're alive and in Christ, then this second half is specifically, strictly for you. What kind of life do you have? Many of you would be familiar with the old movie Princess Bride. It is a kind of a funny movie. In that movie, the, the main hero gets tortured to death. His friends haul him to a doctor kind of guy. And they, the doctor says, well, what if I kill him? They said, you can't kill him. He's already dead. He says, okay, I'll look at him. So he puts him on the table. And he says, I think we can cure him. He says, but he's dead. And the doctor says, no, he's only mostly dead. And mostly dead means he's slightly alive. If he's already dead, there's not much we can do for him. But he's only mostly dead. You know right there describes the average Christian in the country. They live a life where they're mostly dead. The life they have in Christ seems like they're only slightly alive. He's, the average Christian sees his life in Christ as eternal life. Starting somewhere in the future, I'm going to have this life. I'm sure that you've heard how they train circus elephants. They take a circus elephant when he's young and they chain him by the biggest chain they can find to an immovable post by his front leg. And so this circus elephant, he fights and fights because he's chained now by his front leg to this post. And he fights and fights and he cannot break this chain and he cannot get this post out of the ground and therefore he eventually quits fighting. And once they get him to that point, from then po that point on, they just tie a small rope around his leg and to a small post in the ground. And that elephant will never pull that post or break that rope. Because in his mind, when he's tied by his front leg, he cannot get loose. You have this massive elephant who could tear the place apart, and he stands there like he's hum hamstrung because... He's got this little rope around his foot. This is how the average Christian lives their Christian life. The devil somehow has got it into our thinking that this new life in Christ has been reduced in our mind to where we're only mostly dead. That we can't move forward because we are, we're tied up. And we are, in our thinking, mostly dead. We're waiting for some future date to be set free. Now, I'm asking you now. I'm asking you point blank. I'm asking you to think clearly. What kind of life do you have? You are either dead or you are alive. And what kind of life do you have? Have you considered the life that you have. If you were alive this morning, what kind of life is it? I'll tell you what kind of life it is. John 10.10 10, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Romans 6.4 We also should walk in newness of life. Romans 8.6 For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. 1 John 3.14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Ephesians 3.20, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Ephesians 6.10, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Colossians 1.11, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Colossians 2.10, 10, ye are complete in him. 2 Timothy 1, 2. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Does this sound like a life that has been given to us that is limited? Are we mostly dead? Is this the life we have been given? What blinder has the devil put on you to allow such thinking? What little rope is holding you back from the power of Christ's life flowing through you? And I ask you this morning, what kind of life do you have? You are either dead or alive. Do you know that you're alive? And if you are alive, what kind of life do you have? Question number four. Do others know that you're alive? Do others know that you're alive? I've always liked the the cartoon Far Side. I know in this group there are some Far Side aficionados here. I love the Far Side. In one of the Far Sides, there is a cartoon wood scene, and he's always drawing animals and so forth, and it's a wood scene out in the forest but it's definitely and obviously a funeral out in the forest. And there's a casket there, and there's a whole bunch of bears standing around like you'd expect people to be standing around at a funeral. And in the coffin, there's a bear sitting up. And he's got this incredulous look on his face, and he says, I was hibernating for crying out in the night. Don't you people ever take a pulse? Okay. Alive, but nobody knew it. On a more serious note, it's been probably 15 years ago, I suppose, 10 or 15, I can't remember. Our neighbor come flying into our park, our driveway, honking her horn, jump in the car, she said. I jumped in the car with her. We, she went flying down. In the property next to us, there was a man who had been mowing their neighbor's property there. And he got the mower on kind of a, long, a, a steep hill, and he rolled the mower, and the mower ended up landing, laying upside down on his chest. So by the time we got there, um, he'd been there for some time, and so a couple of us jumped out, and we just picked the lawnmower right up off of him and, and put it aside, and he's laying there. He wasn't cut or anything, but he wasn't moving, and the guy, one of the guys that was with us, there were three of us there, and one of them said, anybody know CPR? And I said, I don't, I don't. And so he started doing CPR on the man. There was no life in the man. That life was already gone, and the CPR was for nothing. And so I'm looking at this man. It's an image seared in my brain, because we did not know if he was alive or dead, but he was dead, and no amount of CPR was going to change that. You know, nobody looked around at the rest of us and said, Do I need to do CPR on you? Because it was obvious the rest of us were alive. Life is obvious, is it not? Or should be. Life is obvious. And the people around don't try to do CPR on you. They don't walk up and do this number on you to make sure that you're alive. Because life shows Now ask yourself this question. At work this week, was your life in Christ obvious to everybody around you? When you dealt with your children this week, did they see the life of Christ? 
Does your spouse know by your actions that you have life? Do your neighbors wonder if you are alive or dead? If you have life, that fact ought to be obvious. It ought to show. Do the people around you know that you have life? 1 John 5. Verse 11, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So I ask you this morning, Are you alive or dead? You cannot be both. You have to be one or the other. Two, do you know, do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt, based on the scripture, that you are alive? Number three, what kind of life do you have? What is the life that has been given to you? Number four, do others know that you're alive? My friend, you are either dead or alive. Let's pray.